Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes just because I see some people still um, signing in. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. For everyone out there, my name's Amanda Majewski. I've been with Extra Help three and a half years now. I mostly work in our Metro St. Louis area. Um, I do travel a little bit between our offices as well. So I focus on new business for our payroll services mostly. So I've had a lot of field experience with business owners, making sure they understand wage and hour laws, and also you know where they can go and get more information. There is the chat box down on the right hand side. I will try to get to the if there's any questions and I'll check those at the end once I get through everything and I do want to make sure that we get everything in within um, the hour so I know everyone is very busy. Okay, so lots of questions obviously always come up. How to all often organizations simply just don't know the answers or believe they're paying their employees correctly, but with wage and hour lawsuits continue to rise, there's always misconceptions. Where do you go? Who do you turn to? Who can you ask questions? Who's going to understand? You know, do I have to pay overtime to salaried employees? Can I give comp time to overtime? And what about travel time? So I just want to give an overview of um, where a lot of this information is coming from. Sites that I quite frequently visit is the Wage and Hour Division uh, and underneath the Department of Labor, that, which maintains regulatory authority over the portion of the FLSA. Um, some employers are even targeted by the Department of Labor for compliance because of history of their industry for non-compliance. So some that stick out um, quite often in cases that I read about construction, retail, restaurant. Small and mid-level employers are as much at risk as large employers. Even minor violations may amount to thousands of dollars for each employee in back pay. Uh, employees are also entitled to liquidated damages you know, unless an employer can prove either by documentation, good faith, uh, reasonable belief that they were in compliance with the act. Employees can also obtain three years of back pay by establishing a willful violation with of the act. Just some cases that have kind of happened in the past 10 years or so and with some big companies of names that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. Starbucks, for example, um, they paid up to $18 million to settle two class action lawsuits brought by store managers who claimed that they were wrongfully classified as exempt from overtime requirements. And these are things that we'll talk about further in the slideshow. But their primary duties were serving customers and performing other non-exempt work. 
and another one, Einstein Bagels. Um, they paid over close to 500000 in back pay overtime wages to employees in 27 states following a Department of Labor investigation. The investigation led to um, Einstein misclassifying, again, their managers as exempt when they were primarily serving customer taking orders, for example. So first topic, and this one we'll spend a, t a lot of time on. I've got a lot of information about exempt versus non-exempt. A lot of court cases really do circle around this topic, so I wanted to make sure that I dove a little deeper on this topic because this is where I get a lot of questions anyhow out in the field. So oftentimes one of the most confusing is trying to classify between the two, but an exempt is considered one is someone who's not receiving overtime pay and a non-exempt employee is entitled to overtime. Of the exempt status, there are three types of, um, of employees. And we're going to walk through an executive employee, an administrative employee, and a professional employee. Uh, Non-exempt employees are typically paid on an hourly basis and entitled to overtime compensation, of course. According to FLSA, employers are required to track the hours work and meal periods for non-exempt employees. And I also will talk about meal periods and, and rest periods. This requirement ensures that such employees earn at least minimum wage plus overtime compensation for any hours worked above 40 in a work week. And we will also talk about what is a work week. I know in some states, however, that any hours worked above 8 in a work day also is considered then overtime. To be classified as exempt, Employees generally must meet certain tests regarding their job duties, and those tests is based off of um, salary basis and duty basis. So as I go through the three exemptions, I will, I'll indicate which one is salary, which is a salary test, and which one is the duty test. Job titles do not determine exempt status. This is a huge, huge misconception that people just assume that the title refers to them being exempt status. Um, as long as it meets the job duties and salary of the regulations, that's okay. Um, however, the employee's job generally must satisfy both, like I was speaking about, the salary basis and the duties basis. And exempt employees generally must be paid on a salary basis which is a fixed amount. So we'll go over the first of the three, which is an executive exempt status. Um, as of this year, it could change starting January 2015. I haven't read anything yet, but considered on a salary base uh, a rate at least of 455 a week. The employee's primary duty must be managing the enterprise, uh, overseeing departments, things like that. An employee um, must direct at least work of two other full-time employees or their equivalent. And they must also have the authority to hire or fire other employees. So from my first bullet point, that would be the salary basis, and then the three underneath it would be considered meeting the duties basis test as well. All right, an administrative exempt status, again, the $455. Their primary duty must be the performance of office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operations. And the employee's primary duty includes the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance. And of the last of the three professional exempt status, there is actually two sections underneath the professional exempt status. So there's learned professionals 
and there are also is creative professionals. Creative professionals are artists, composers, actors, writers, you know, mus musicians, people like that. Again, learn professionals at a rate of not less than 455 a week. Uh, their primary duty must be the performance of work requiring advanced knowledge. Uh, the advanced knowledge must be in a field of science. And the knowledge must be customarily required by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction. Underneath creative, again, that $455 a week. And their primary duty must be the performance of work requiring invention, imagination, development. So when can you, can you deduct from a salary without losing the exemption? So to pass the salary basis test, an employee's weekly salary must be paid without reductions for variations in the quantity or quality of work performed. An employee must be paid for any week in which any time was worked. Even if your salaried employee is coming in late, leaving early, wages cannot be deducted without jeopardizing the exemption. This obviously often frustrates employers, maybe other employees, because it's perceived that the salaried employee is abusing their salaried position. However, deducting wages would result in losing the exempt status. So and I encourage if you have someone who's abusing their position as a salaried employee, classify them as an hourly employee and you know make them start tracking their time. Should an employer opt to track the hours of exempt employees, a company will need to be very careful with respect to how to use the information. Um, a company may only take a deduction from an exempt employee salary under limited circumstances without jeopardizing the status. Uh, so docking a full day increment of one or more days, um, some scenarios that can come up, for example, the, the first and last week of employment. So let's say, for example, an employee starts on a Wednesday. Uh, they are only due to be paid for the days worked that first week. So three days, for example. Uh, personal leave, if no work is done for a full day taken as a personal day, then the full day can be deducted from pay. Um, like I said earlier, you know, leaving work for a couple hours of personal time does not result in a, in a deduction for a salaried employee. Illnesses, accidents, you know, those come up. If they're not covered um, by their paid time off program or, you know, maybe they've used their time already and an issue like this comes up. Um, Disciplinary deductions also can happen if there's an incident within the work environment, you know, a manufacturing firm, let's say some safety violations came up, OSHA came in. So, however, I'd be careful with any deductions, even allowed deductions. And again, consider whether this person should truly be a salaried employee. So some employers opt to track the hours simply to ensure the treatment of all employees regardless of classification in the company. I think that is a safe practice if you don't, if you do find that you've got salaried individuals abusing their rights as an exempt employee. Um, so I would just set the standard that it just needs to be company-wide that everyone clocks in regardless. Um, so I've got some examples there. An employer may opt to track an exempt empl an employee's hours for purpose of um, for client billing, you know, even like an engineering company, regardless, they have to 
use for client billing to track jobs so they know what hours have to be sent and billed for their clients. Um, FMLA, 401k, um, obviously attendance is a good practice, again, to have documentation, to have in their file when it came to review time. Um, another thing that comes up too that I get a lot of questions about is the FL FLSA does not require that non-exempt employees be paid hourly. Um, non-exempt employees may be paid by means of a salary. So salary non-exempt employees are still entitled to their overtime pay. Um, when a non-exempt employee is paid by a salary, the amount of salary must be converted to its hourly equivalent to determine the regular rate of pay. So how can we avoid misclassifying an exempt employee? Good documentation, having up-to-date job descriptions to keep on record They've signed an employee agreement that they've reviewed their job duties. They know what's required of them in case you got a phone call from the Department of Labor. If the essential elements of the job are of a routine and standard nature, then most likely the employees, they do not exercise discretion and independent judgment on behalf of the company and therefore should be classified as a non-exempt employee. Generally, most business owners have the tendency to misclassify administrative hourly employees as exempt. And I do see this quite often. And a rule that you should keep in mind is the amount of discretion and independent judgment that employee can exercise of their duties. So whether the duties of a particular job qualifies as exempt depends on what they are. Job titles, like I talked about earlier, or position descriptions are of limited usefulness. So for example, a secretary is still a secretary even if he or she is called an administrative assistant. And the chief executive officer is still the CEO even if she or he is called a janitor. It is the actual job task that must be evaluated. You know, clerical work may be administrative, but it is not exempt. Most secretaries uh, accur may accurately be said to be performing administrative work, but their jobs are not usually exempt. Filing, filling out forms, and preparing routine reports, answering telephones, you know, making travel arrangements, working on customer projects, similar jobs, are not likely to be high level enough to be administrative exempt. So some preventative and proactive actions. I actually have a little self-audit here. So audit payroll and timekeeping records and overtime practices for the past three years. Enact effective overtime policies indicating overtime must be pre-approved at your workplace. Effective document the use and administration of what comp time is um, or if it's going to be paid deductions. Remember that exemptions are the exception to the rule. Number of exempt employees should be much smaller than the number of non-exempt employees. Try to identify any problem areas in timekeeping practices. So again, reviewing time cards, each pay period versus, okay, looks good, the totals are there. This is another way to help identify problems with having automated timekeeping in place. Determining those employees who may be working over 40 hours in a seven-day period and determine if the overtime rules apply to these employees. Find those employees who are working two or more separate jobs for your company and track the number of hours worked in a seven-day period. 
review comp time policies and procedures. You know, I encourage to review your policies at least yearly, maybe every six months, just because laws, especially employment law, changes drastically. And definitely your good faith defense by having legal counsel review your exemption decisions and they can help with an opinion, later, opinion letter. Um, they can obviously help with creating a handbook if you don't have one. And last but not least, displaying posters, labor law posters in places where employees can see them, cafeteria room, a break room, um, whenever employees really kind of have like a, a co-mingling area where everyone is usually at. Okay, so the next misconception that I wanted to talk about, and I had talked about it briefly in the very beginning, but how do you define your work week? Work week is convenient to the employer. Uh, it is seven consecutive 24-hour periods, and each work week stands alone. I can't stress that enough. Each work week stands alone. Once the beginning time of an employee's work week is established, it remains fixed regardless of the hours the employee is scheduled to work. However, the beginning of the work week may be changed if the change is intended to be permanent and is not designed to evade the overtime requirements. So if changing, um, you must pay the hire of the overtime, for example, your old work week compared to the new work week for changeover week. Uh, nothing in the FLSA guarantees an employee any particular amount of work time or requires any particular schedule of work. An employer may adjust schedules within a work week to avoid an employee working FLSA overtime. All right, third misconception I run across. Okay, we're going to talk about sleep and travel time. Um, this really is a yes, no type of scenario. Um, typical problems that run across is employers fail to recognize and count certain hours worked as um, compensation. For example, an employee who remains at his or her desk while eating lunch and regularly answering the telephone and refers callers is working. And this time should be counted and paid as hours worked because the employee has not obviously been completely relieved of their duty. Um, waiting time, for example, you know, secretary, let's Say they are reading a book while waiting for a dictation or like a fireman who's like playing checkers while waiting for an alarm to go off. You know, these employees are engaged to wait. Sleeping time, you know, an employee who is required to be on duty for less than 24 hours is working even though they are permitted to sleep or engage in other personal activities when not busy. Um, an employee required to be on duty for 24 hours or more may agree with the employer to exclude from hours worked, bona fide regularly scheduled sleeping periods, or of not more than eight hours, provided adequate sleeping facilities are furnished by the employer. Uh, no reduction is permitted unless at least five hours of sleep has been taken. So again, waiting time, whether waiting time is hours worked under the act depending upon the particular circumstance. On-call time, an employee who's required to remain on call, like I talked about, the, um, the fireman and the secretary. And then also lastly, like lectures, meetings, training programs, those things come up as well. Um, those, you know, need not to be counted as working time, only if they're uh, obviously, if it's outside normal working hours 
again, if it's voluntary, for example, I am a, a board member for a, a local not-for-profit, and, you know, I'm obviously, that is not paid time because that's voluntary. Again, that also is not related to my job. Um, and then also if no other work is current, is concurrently performed. So a little bit on more talking about uh, more on the travel side now. Um, the principles which apply in determining whether time spent in travel is compensable. Time depends upon the kind of travel actually involved. So what are some of those? Home to work travel. Again, an employee who travels from home before the regular workday and returns to home at the end of the workday is engaged in ordinarily home to work travel time. And that's not work time. You know, I live in St. Louis. I traveled to a different office this morning. That is not work. That was not work time this morning for me. Home to work on a special one day assignment in another city. So an employee who regularly works at a fixed location in one city, uh, they might have to travel to a different city where they have an office, but they're still returning home. That time spent traveling to and from the other city is considered work time, except that the employer may deduct or not count the time the employee would normally spend commuting to the regular work site. Travel that is all day in a day's work. So time spent by an employee in travel as part of their principal activity, such as travel from job site to job site during the workday, is work time and must be counted. And traveling away to another community, travel that keeps an employee away from home overnight, travel away from home. Um, you know, for example, if I want to if I've got to go out to our Phoenix market, that obviously is um, time that I would still be paid for, for traveling out there. All right, going on to our next topic that I mentioned in the very beginning as well, of employees having the option to skip meal periods or breaks. Te technically, no. Um, there was a case back in late September um, that I read about that Chipotle was um, alleged to have devised and implemented general policies and practices to deprive its hourly paid restaurant employees of their wages that they were entitled. And um, reading further into the case, Chipotle uses, they have a timekeeping system in place that basically was um, creating auto punches when actual staff is, was still on, on the clock, but had them clocked out. Uh, rest periods of short duration, usually 20 minutes or less, that's pretty common um, in the workspace and is typically considered working time. Uh, federal law does not require lunch or coffee breaks. However, when employers do offer the short breaks, again, it's usually up to the 20 minutes. Uh, federal law considers those breaks to be um, pay time that's considered in their sum of hours. Uh, generally, uh, for agreement, it's really between the employer and the employee as well at the state level, and we will get into that a little bit here. So I mostly just listed um, where a lot of our business is. There is tons of information out on the web. And if someone has some more questions, feel free to reach out to me or we can um, talk later today as well. So I've got listed here that there are 20 states with meal period requirements. But I've just got listed here um, just some of the ones that are um, local and more familiar with me. So Illinois, employees uh, are entitled to meal breaks over 20 minutes, no later than five hours after beginning their shift. And the employee uh, will have to work up seven and a half hours to get that 20 minute. 
Um, if you're working fewer than the seven and a half hours, no lunch break is required. Um, if you are in a job monitoring those who have um, mental illness or disabilities, a meal break may not be required. Uh, for Indiana, there are no laws for meal breaks for adults, especially in the private sector. Um, employees in West Virginia are they're entitled to take a meal break of at least 20 minutes for each six consecutive hours that they work. Um, if an employee is eating while working, they are entitled to be paid for this time, of course. Um, rest periods by state as well. Um, for Illinois, there is a rule for hotel room attendees. Um, they get provided two breaks, 15 minutes each, if they work at least seven hours. Um, Indiana employers must follow only the federal rules. Um, in other words, although breaks are not required, employers must pay employees for time they spend working for shorter breaks during the day. And, you know, West Virginia, again, they also do not have a required rest breaks, but again, the same apply that I spoke about for Indiana. Okay, next misconception is an employer decision, and this is talking about overtime for benefits. So the FLSA does not provide wage payment or collection procedures for an employee's usual or promised wages or commissions in excess of those required by the FLSA. However, some states do have laws under which some claims may be filed. Um, also, the FLSA does not limit the number of hours in a day or days in a week an employee may be required or scheduled to work, including overtime hours. If the employee is at least 16 and the, the employer gets to decide what is work time. Um, so some things that the FSLA does not require, vacation, holiday, severance, sick meal, the rest period, holidays off vacations, um, premium pay, uh, pay raises, fringes. All right, do you know the laws that govern overtime rules? So again, this is a pretty hot topic, especially in our payroll industry. <clears throat> so there's no limit in the act on the number of hours employees at the age of 16 or older may work in any work week. Uh, for non-exempt employees, the FLSA requires overtime pay at a rate of not less than one and one and a half times of the employee's regular rate of pay after 40 hours of work in a work week. Um, there are exceptions to the rule, of course, for this. Hospitals, police, nursing homes, they definitely have different um, rules when it comes to their hours in a work week. So some states do have enacted overtime laws um, where an employee is subject to both the state and federal overtime laws. Um, so the employee is entitled to overtime according to the higher standard, of course. Uh, the Department of Labor has undergone several compliance enforcement developments that have um, changed wage and hour regulations. Um, one area that the Department of Labor has targeted addresses overtime issues, of course. Um, FLSA requires overtime pay to be paid to most employees at the rate, again, of the one and, and one and a half times their regular rate of pay when they've worked over the 40 hours. Um, you know, unfortunately, Many employers violate the overtime pay law, often by just inconsistently calculating the rate at which overtime should be paid, failing to count the off-the-clock work activities that I talked about earlier, incorrectly claiming that certain employees are exempt from overtime laws, 
So calculating over time correctly is very, very important. Um, many employers continue to be confused even with the basic formula. So I do have an example that I can walk through too. Uh, the regular rate of pay is calculated by adding up all the pay and dividing it by the total number of hours worked. Um, the state minimum wage rate requirements are controlled by legislative activities within individual states. So federal minimum law supersedes state minimum wage laws where the federal minimum wage is greater than the state minimum wage. However, in those states where the state minimum wage is greater than the federal minimum wage, the state minimum wage supersedes that. There are three states that have a minimum wage set lower than the federal. And the, there are also 19 states that have a minimum wage requirement that is that has a minimum wage requirement that is the same as the federal minimum wage requirement. And the remaining five states do not have an established minimum wage. Um, I know the district of uh, Washington, D.C., they have the highest minimum wage at nine and a half. And Georgia, Wyoming, they, I think, are at the bottom, it's a little over $5.15 an hour, I believe. So for my example here, so let's say employee X. Uh, works at a rate of $10 an hour for 40 hours, but they also work in another department at $8 an hour for an additional 10 hours. So we want to multiply those hours by their appropriate rate, of course. So you can see here I've got a total of 480. So the sum of my hours worked are 50. So I want to divide that 50 hours by the 480 to come up with my regular rate of pay of $9.60. So next I want to take my $9.60 and multiply it by one and a half of, of the overtime pay rate and I get my overtime rate of $14.40. So I'm going to take my $14.40, multiply it by that 10 overtime hours for it's an additional $144, add it to my um, regularly worked wages of 400 for my gross wages being $544 for the week. All right, the eighth misconception that I come across very frequently, especially in my, um, I, I work in a startup community downtown St. Louis where this is a very big conversation with new employers, um, people who just, they want to hire interns just because, well, they're a startup, they typically don't have a whole lot of funds themselves, and but they obviously need um, team members to get their company up and going. So there are six criteria to qualify a job position as a legitimate unpaid internship. So I'll, I'll go through these six here. Offer training similar to the educational environment. It has to benefit the intern. It cannot displace any regular employees. Um, it provides no immediate benefit to the employer. It's uh, not necessarily entitled to, as a paid position and set clear expectations that the internship is of an educational nature and that the intern is uh, not to be paid. Uh, simply put, employers cannot avoid the requirements of federal law by simply labeling employees as interns or trainees to minimize costs. So how can how do we qualify a valid internship program? Is the work a key part of the individual's course of study? Does the individual receive educational credit at work? 
do you have written documentation stating that the internship that the internship is approved or sponsored? Does the individual get the opportunity to learn the, a skill process or another business function? Does the individual work for the purpose of learning and not solely performing a task for the employer? Does one of your staff members supervise the individual? Does the individual provide any benefit to you less than 50% of the time? Or does the individual understand that a job is not guaranteed upon completing the internship? So the more you can answer yes to the, these questions, the more likely you are in compliance with having a properly classified intern. And the less likely the department label will have a case against your business that the individual should be owed wages and overtime. All right, the next misconception <clears throat> that I wanted to go over, uh, rounding time cards for easy payroll calculations. All right. Whether you call it rounding or they call it the seven-eighths rule or, or have no word to describe it at all, rounding may be of a concern for employers, both in your day-to-day -day operations and then also litigation. Um, rounding is the practice of adjusting time clock punch times within specific bounds. You know, for example, if an employee punches in for work at 757, 801, 802, your rounding rules may treat all of these punches as occurring at 8 a.m. for payroll purposes. Um, this practice of rounding employees' time up or down in increments is allowed, according to FLSA. Most importantly, though, they do not require employers to round time, though. If you're, if you're using a system of recording and calculating time uh, work to permit you to track time down to the exact minute, then I would stick with that. I encourage that. Paying for the actual time work is always the best practice. Um, however, for those the view that can't easily track time down in exact minute, there um, the FLSA regulations provides employers you know may utilize time clocks that round up or down in increments of up to a quart, up to a quarter hour. So long the clock uh, rounds both ways. Occasionally, it's in the company's favor and occasionally benefiting the employees. So if an employee time from one to seven minutes may be rounded down and thus be counted as hours worked, but an employee time from eight to 14 minutes must be rounded up and counted as a quarter hour of work time. So an example here, an employer only records and pays for time if employee work in the full 15 minute increments an employee paid $10 per hour scheduled to work eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, for a total of 40 hours a week. The employee always clocks out 12 minutes after the end of the shift. The employee is paid the $400 per week. So does this comply with the FLSA? No. The employer has violated the overtime requirements. The employee worked an hour each week, so that the 12 minutes after their shift, so, and it was a Monday through Friday, so five times, 60 minutes, that's an hour. The employer has not violated the minimum wage requirements because the employee was paid 975 based off of the 41 hours worked divided by the, gro or divided by the gross wage of the 400, we get our 975. However, the employer owes the employee for one hour of overtime each week. All right, we're nearing the end, guys. So when is the final paycheck due? So this is um, really state-specific. I've got listed here, again, some of companies within the states that we work. Um, again, if you want more information, I would be more than happy to get it for you as well. Um, in Indiana, which I don't have listed on here, if an employee is fired, 
Uh, they are to be given next scheduled payday. If an employee quits, uh, it's the next scheduled payday. If an employee has not provided a forwarding address, an employer may wait until 10 days after employee demands wages or until the employee provides an address where the check can be mailed. Um, here for Arizona, if an employee is fired within seven working days or next payday, whichever is sooner. If an employee quits, uh, next payday is fine. Illinois, if an employee is fired at time of separation if possible, but no later than the next payday. <clears throat> and then if they, if they quit um, at time of separation or no later than the next payday, again. Missouri is quite different. If an employee is fired, it's a day of discharge. Um, can a company, I get asked this, can a company deduct from an employee's final wages for lost or damaged company property? Yes and no. You know, many states have mandatory requirements regarding deductions to final paychecks. Um, many states require written authorization prior, uh, and any other states do not allow deductions in which the company would then have to send an employee an invoice for the damaged or returned items. Again, so that's uh, state-specific. Um, some federal guidelines for other termination issues, such as severance pay, um, official termination notification, distribution of final check, et cetera. Um, The official termination notification, a written notice of date, you definitely would need to get that. Service letters pertaining to time of service with the employer. A final payment of wages and or benefits due to the former employee. Um, all, all of these issues, again, are subject to um, state by state. All right, and the last bit that I wanted to go over is deducting expenses. So voluntary payroll deductions are withheld from an employee's paycheck only if the employee has agreed to the deduction. Uniforms, union dues, meals, other job-related expenses can be paid either pre-tax or after-tax dollars depending on that type of benefit being paid for. Uh, the pre-tax deductions, some reduce wages subject to federal income tax, and then there's others, um, their deductions are reduced off of Social Security and Medicare taxes. So it's definitely important to know the, the difference of if it's a pre-tax, after-tax. Um, where a lot of this information is and what I frequently visit is an IRS publication. It's the employer's tax guide where it talks about fringe benefits. And as always, if you're not sure, especially if you've got um, a benefit carrier, reaching out to them, consult them. They're going to have that in your plan and they should be able to provide that information to you to make sure that the, you're deducting expenses correctly. And more so, um, I wanted to talk about a uniform expense. The FLSA does not allow uniforms or other items, which are considered to be primarily for the benefit or convenience of the employer, to be included in wages. Um, the FLSA does not require that employees wear uniforms. However, if wearing a, of a uniform is required by some other law, you know, let's say it's just their profession or by the employer, the, the cost and maintenance of the uniform is considered to be a business expense of the employer. And if an employer requires the employee to bear the cost, it may not reduce the employee's wage below the minimum wage. So an employer can prorate the deduction of the cost for the uniform over a period of paydays, provided the prorated deductions do not reduce, again, the employee's wages below the required minimum wage or overtime compensation in a work week. So, for example, if an employee who is subject to the minimum wage of seven and a quarter, the employer may not make any deduction from the employee's wages for the cost of the uniform 
nor may the employer require the employee to purchase the uniform on their own. However, if an employee was paid $7.75 per hour and worked 30 hours in a work week, the maximum amount the employer could legally deduct from the employee's wages would be $15 an hour. So I would take my 50 cents, the difference between the minimum wage and what the rate it was paid, times the 30 hours. So the employee's wages would be $15 an hour, for example. Um, some examples of items which would be considered to be for the benefit or convenience of the employer are tools used in the employee's work, uh, damages to the employer's property by the employee or any other individuals, um, financial losses due to clients, customers not paying bills, and, and or theft. Um, employees may not be required to pay for any of the costs of such items. And if doing by so, the wages would be reduced below the required minimum wage or overtime calculation. So last but not least, and this is something, again, I can send out to anyone. So if you're interested, you feel free to type it in the chat box. If anything that you've seen on here you want a copy of, please let I or um, Aaron Kopech know. But... Um, the last bit here is a checklist that I wanted just to share with everyone, just as for some good things just to keep in, to keep in mind. You know, assure that all your employees are earning at least the minimum wage at either the state or federal level, whichever is higher. Specify the seven-day work week that will be used for overtime calculations, uh, making sure that's specified in your, um, your company handbook. Verify that the frequency of paydays conform to your state's requirements. Make sure that any requirement of direct deposit of wages is permitted in your state. Determine each position's non-exempt or exempt status under the FLSA or any relevant state equivalent. Ensure that overtime is being calculated and paid correctly based on the state and federal requirement for the payment of overtime on a daily and or weekly basis. Ensure that an overtime rate is being calculated correctly based on the regular rate of pay. Verify whether there are any state requirements for mandatory meal and or rest breaks. If so, verify that non-exempt staff is adhering to those requirements. So checking people's time cards, um, walking through the floor, if it's, you know, a Let's say it's lunch break for a lot of people and, and spot checking. Train non-exempt staff and supervisory personnel on the requirements to accurately complete time reporting records such as timesheets, automated timekeeping. Assure that the final payment of wages to terminating employees are in accordance with your state's final paycheck requirements, including any payment of unused vacation time. Make sure that any non-standard deductions to paychecks, such as uniform expenses, expenses for tools, etc., are authorized in writing by employees and are um, compliant with your state wage and hour regulations. Double check if federal and state labor law posting requirements have been satisfied. Um, let's see here. Every employer, regardless of company size, must comply with basic employment laws that regulate wage and hour factors. At a time when litigation and agency investigations are ramping up, getting a good grasp of fundamental wage and hour information and tools is especially important. Um, I'm going to just check here. What time is it? 1024. So there is one question out there that I can let me see here. So what if you're, you are a Missouri-based company working in Illinois? That's an awesome question, and this is something that does come up. So what if you are a Missouri-based company and working in Illinois? So if that's the case, working in Illinois, um, and I can follow up too as well because I'm curious as for, is it just their work in Illinois, or do you have um, a, a, 
a place of employment do you have another location for example so I'll follow up with um, our asker on that one so as for what's next we just want to highlight that we have um, another webinar next Thursday the 20th at 9:30 again it's titled it's your business only you can make the best of it and that will be presented by Lucas Brimmer of Edwards Jones so if you want any more information about it, if you want to register, uh, feel free to email Aaron here. Again, feel free to email Aaron um, if you have any other questions on the slides that I had. If you want copies of anything, I'd be more than happy to get those out to our listeners today. So I thank everyone for attending and um, enjoy the rest of your week.